As we try to follow our own ancestral lineage throughout this series, I've tried to show not only how we've changed over time, but also how the world has changed around us, especially the different varieties of animals that were once our neighbors, competitors, or predators in each period. For most of that, our ancestry has only been concerned with one surviving lineage, as all or most of our closest relatives have extinct. But there was such a radiation of other important lineages to survive the KT extinction that ended the age of dinosaurs and began the age of mammals that I would be remiss if I didn't mention them. So, every episode since that point, we've had to keep jumping back to that moment to follow the evolution of a different branch of fauna starting with meridiungulates or mesonychids that you might never know about otherwise, leading to more familiar fauna like artiodactyls and cetaceans, among other things, to see how the world we know is shaping up. In each of those episodes, we mentioned perissodactyls, though only in passing. That's another group of ungulates, or hooved animals. I should say hooved mammals, because in the Paleocene through Eocene, there was actually a hooved crocodilian, too, one that evidently hunted on land and galloped after small ungulates, eating the first perissodactyls that we're talking about today. And somehow, hooves were all the rage back then, even though they developed independently a few times. And remember that hooves are just thickened toenails that envelop the ends of the toes and protect them from sharp rocks or stickers and such. You know, the reason we invented shoes except that most of these animals run only on their tippy toes and not on their whole foot. Meridiungulates, which we talked about before, and proboscidians, which we'll talk about next time, both walked on their whole foot, although they had each five toes with hooves to help carry their weight without injury. Laragiotherians, which we talked about last time, all started with five toes, but they're subdivided mostly according to the number of toes they still have, with artiodactyls being typically even-numbered, whether four toes in most cases or only two in the case of tylopods. Of course, whales still have toes, too. They're just hidden inside their flippers. Cetaceans aren't the only hooved animals that are like that. It turns out that a few different groups return to the water and develop flippers where hooves used to be, strange though that may seem. Take Desmostylia, for example. You've probably never heard of these, so imagine what a herd of cattle would look like if they tried to live like seals. Although their long, flattened fingers aren't quite flippers yet, they're well on the way to becoming that. And because their tails were already greatly reduced before returning to the water, they couldn't adapt them into the powerful flukes that whales and manatees have because there wasn't enough left to work with. So Desmostylians were more like seals in that they had to rely on the power of their front limbs. But they weren't built for speed and they evidently couldn't compete with Serenians once they appeared on the scene. Imagine being so inefficiently designed that you're unable to compete with a manatee. But that's evidently what happened. So unlike Serenians and Cetaceans, Desmostylians are now entirely extinct. They ranged from the Oligocene through the Miocene, so we've never seen one alive. And that's too bad because these had to be odd-looking things, with strangely arranged teeth and short tusks pointing out forward out of their faces. These animals apparently lounged around the shallows of the beach or near the beach and ate marine vegetation like seaweed and kelp. Because they were so strange, Desmostylians were difficult to classify. They were once thought to be aphrotheres, even though they have four toes, and they're typically found along the northern Pacific Rim. So maybe not aphrotherians. They are currently listed in the next branch over from the artiodactyls we talked about in the last episode, having traits that associate them with perissodactyls. Perissodactyls are the odd-toed ungulates that began with something like this hyracotherium, which had four toes on its front feet, but only three on its back feet. This here is the same way, with four toes on its front and three on the back, so they're classified close together. And that sets the template for all their descendants eventually having no more than three toes on each foot. On the tapiromorph side, we have tapirs, of course, as well as other tapir-like things in a clade called ceratomorphs, meaning horns, because tapirs are closely related to rhinoceros, all of which have only three toes on all four feet. And there are more species of rhinoceros than you're probably aware of hidden in the fossil record, including one that didn't have a horn, but it didn't need one either. Paraceratherium relied on its sheer size to protect it. This thing was huge. Its shoulder was as tall as a giraffe's head. And for a long time, Paraceratherium, previously known as Andricotherium, was the largest land mammal confirmed to date. But there is another genus and a different order that we'll talk about next time that might be even bigger. And next to ceratomorphs are encyclopoda, and this is where it gets a little weird. 
because here we have calicotheres, things that look very much like three-toed horses, but horses with claws instead of hooves. Perhaps it's a secondary atavism that provided some useful advantage, but it's uncertain what that was or how some of these things walked because the size of their claws, as well as their disproportionately long arms on some species, must have made for awkward ambulation. And getting back to the base of tapiromorphs, we'll take another track now to hippomorphs. And that doesn't mean hippo-shaped. Remember that the word hippopotamus is Greek for water horse, if you can imagine that. So hippomorphs are animals that are horse-shaped. Well, except for this thing. A brontotheroidea means thunder beast. And how cool is that? Uh, this family includes my favorite genus of the Eocene period. Megacerops is more closely related to horses than to rhinos, though it's hard to tell that at first glance. You have to look at its skeleton to see that this is built like a really stout horse. And then, of course, we move on to things that actually do look like horses. This is the lineage of equines. This is where we see a sequence of species starting from, say, Mesohippus, showing how three original toes were reduced down to one, and that lineage eventually gave us horses, donkeys, and zebras, among other things. So that sets the stage, giving you an idea of the environment that we're talking about today. Now, getting back to our own lineage. We're looking at the Oligocene period, 34 to 23 million years ago. At that time, the earliest simiaforms, or monkeys, were represented by parapithecoids, an ancient group of primitive monkeys that are now all extinct. But they're different from any extant monkeys, and also more generalized, representing the common ancestral link between both halves of what will become the next big division in this group. All monkeys that are still alive today are in one of two categories. New World monkeys, Platyrrhini, which of course are found in the New World or the Americas, and Old World monkeys, or Catarrhini, which are found from Africa throughout Eurasia. What's the difference between them? Well, in a sense, New World monkeys are actually more primitive than Old World monkeys, having gotten trapped on the South American continent after it split away from Africa. Living in the lush rainforests there, New World monkeys generally have longer, stronger tails, even prehensile tails, whereas the tails of Old World monkeys are weaker and diminished, or even absent altogether in the case of some Japanese or Spanish macaques. The fingernails of New World monkeys are still fingernails and not claws, but in some groups they're curved and more claw-like, whereas the nails of Old World monkeys tend to be flattened, you know, like yours are. And each group has its own distinct dentition, but they're primarily distinguished by the position of their nostrils. New World platyrrhines have nostrils that are splayed out in different directions, where Old World catarrhines have nostrils that are always pointed downward. You know, like yours. There are some other notable features that we'll talk about next time, but for right now, remember what we talked about last time, that you have all the characteristics required to qualify as a monkey. Not just that you're related to monkeys, nor evidence that you're descended from monkeys, but that you are still a monkey right now. So, let's determine what kind of monkey you are. If in each quarter of your mouth you have two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars, then you have the dental formula of an old world monkey. New world monkeys have one more premolar than old world monkeys have in each quarter of their mouth, which gives them 36 teeth overall, while old world monkeys have a maximum of 32, you know, like humans do. On top of that, if your tail is small and weak, or if you don't have a tail at all, which is vastly more likely in your case, apart from the occasional atavism, that's an old world monkey trait. And probably most importantly, if you have flattened fingernails and you use them to pick your nose this way instead of this way, well, you probably shouldn't monkey with that.